We're looking at a consistent credo, a consistent credo or creed. Before the New Testament was written, the only Bible, of course, that the early Christians had, the earliest Christians, that is the very Judaic church that was born on the day of Pentecost and existed only embryonically before Pentecost, the Hebrew Feast of Weeks, Hag Shavuot, their only Bible was the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. In time, the apostles wrote, Mark being probably the first gospel, James most probably being the first epistle and oldest book of the New Testament written, the book of Revelation written at the end of the first century A.D. C.E. being the close of the canon of the Brita Hadashah of the New Testament. But there was a period when the apostles were writing and when the gospel authors were writing. Uh, Mark almost certainly wrote the first gospel at the dictation of Peter. We have first century manuscript fragments of John. We know the gospels are first century documents. But the essential beliefs of the early Christians were preserved in something known as credos, credos, or creeds. These came from something known, the line of faith, the line of faith, the basic teachings of the New Testament in light of the old, the line of faith gave us the credos or creeds. The two predominant ones are the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. We have creedal Christianity holding to the line of faith, the essential truths of Jesus, who he was, what he did, what he taught. The Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was crucified, died, and was buried. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He descended into um, the netherworld, into Hades, rose again the third day. He will come to judge the living and the dead. These are the basic truths. In time, these were elaborated upon or expounded, not the truths themselves, but the explanation of them as the New Testament books were written. So we finally had the complete canon of Scripture, both the Old Testament and the New. Technically speaking, although the books of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, already existed and were recognized as the inspired Word of God among the Jews and among the early Jewish Christians, the canon was rabbinically formalized at the Council of Yavne in about 90 A.D., or Common Era. However, the books had been held as canonical before that. It was just not a formal declaration uh, by rabbinic authorities. There was much dispute at times, and certainly debate, as to what books should be included in the canon of the New Testament. Some books were never disputed. Everyone agreed there was a consensus about the Gospels and about some of the epistles. But there was debates about certain other books. Should they be included or should they not be included? The final canon of the New Testament was not agreed to the Council of Nicaea, which was a time when the church began to make changes for the worst after Constantine pseudo-Christianized the Roman Empire. Nonetheless, the books were held as canonical before that. Once again, as in Yavne, with the rabbis, the canon was formalized, formalized, even though the books themselves were held to be canonical. The acceptance of canonicity of the New Testament books was based on what the apostles held to be canonical, what the apostles wrote, 
and what they themselves held to be canonical. I'm convinced that what we have now is a complete canon. There are nebulous areas, such as First and Second Enoch and the books of Maccabees, things that have reference in the New Testament, but were not held as canonical, yet were recognized as biblically important history and literature. We could say this about the intertestamental apocryphal books of Enoch and also Maccabees. There was also historical reference books, such as the book of Yeshua. Again, I don't say that these books are a basis of doctrine, but they are biblically important history and literature to help us understand doctrine. Nonetheless, the books as we generally have them now in the mainstream Christian canon, I believe are the word of God is the word of God gave them the 66 books. Later on, Roman Catholicism added apocryphal books as canonical. They did this after they needed to find ways to justify the sales of indulgences. There was a reference in the apocryphal books that it's good to pray for the dead. Now, in its context, when that was written, it meant to pray that the Messiah would come because he would bring salvation to the living and the dead and bring the power of the resurrection. The Roman Catholic Church read into this passage, which was apocryphal, something more than it said or meant in its own time when it was authored, praying to get people out of purgatory. Nonetheless, we have the 66 books. There were later rabbinic and Roman Catholic and in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, editions, apocryphal editions. Be that as it may, I'd like to talk about some important very important, yet very basic considerations that every saved Christian should have a handle on, but many do not. What is the difference between biblical Christianity and religion, or biblical Christianity and non-biblical expressions of what falsely professes to be Christianity? Now, we've addressed this subject before. We pointed out that religion, per se, is man trying to reach God. Biblical Christianity, however, is the gospel. It is the diametric opposite of religion. It is God trying to reach man. The gospel, biblical Christianity, is the diametric opposite of religion. Religion says man is basically good and has the potential to be good. The gospel says man was created to be good, but he's basically fallen and does not have the potential to be good or righteous through his own efforts. Fallen man must be justified through a faith in Christ involving repentance and trust in his righteousness as opposed to our own. We were created to be righteous, but we became basically fallen. We need the imputed righteousness of Christ, not a righteousness of our own that won't merit unto salvation. Third difference was our faith is reasonable. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord in the Old Testament. Paul writes, our faith is reasonable. There is an apologia, an apologetic. There are credible empirical reasons to believe in the claims of Jesus and in the historicity of both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament. It is not a blind faith. Religions rely on a blind faith, something that cannot be verified by any kind of independent source or objective source. It's true because the text says it's true. What outside verification do you have? For instance, Christianity, biblical Christianity, is predicated on the historical truth and reality of the resurrection of Jesus. In the Avodah Zerah, Orthodox rabbis who rejected him as the Messiah acknowledged he rose from the dead. 
Roman historians, Suetonius, Tacitus, wrote of the early Christians being willing to be martyred, testifying that many witnesses in different places at different times saw the Lord Jesus alive <clears throat> after he had been crucified by the Romans. There's evidence, empirical evidence. Our faith is not an intellectual faith, but it is intellectually defensible. It is not believe it because the book says to believe it. It is something that is examinable in its essential points. That is the line of faith, the credo, the credo essence of the belief. But then we have a problem. We have religions claiming to be Judeo-Christian, but are not. Some of them would even appear to subscribe to the line of faith, to the credo, and the ecumenical movement has been able to make inroads into the thinking even among saved Christians by having a creedal profession or confession. We believe in the creeds, we believe in the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the Anastasian Creed, we believe in, in the Nicene Creed, we believe in the essential truths of the faith and the historicity of Jesus and the Gospels. Therefore, we are Christians just as you are, even though we may have varying doctrines, our essential doctrines are the same. That is the claim of the ecumenical movement. Certainly, in seeking union with Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, and increasingly with Mormonism, ironically. Is this true? Well, let's begin looking at something that we've talked about before on other of our teachings. Look with me, please, if you will, to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 2. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. If we add to Scripture or take away from it, we will not keep his commandments. And if we love him, we are told we will keep his commandments. Let's look, please, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 30. Proverbs, chapter 30. This chapter of Proverbs speaks much about the Word of God. It speaks a great deal about the subject. But we are told in Proverbs chapter 30 uh, not to add to the Word of God. We will be proved to be a liar if we do. Every word is tested in verse 5. In verse 6, do not add to his words, lest he reprove you, and you become liars. Those who add to the canon of Scripture will be proven to be liars. Look with me also, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 15. In verse 9, in vain do they worship me, teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men. This quotes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 13. Jesus directly quotes Isaiah. Jesus pronounced judgment on the scribes and Pharisees of his day. Because they were teaching as precepts of God the inventions of men. This is a dangerous thing. We'll come back to this in one moment. But look with me finally to Revelation chapter 22. I know many of you know this. 
Verse 18, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, not just the book of Revelation, but this is the closing of the canon of the New Testament and of Scripture. You can't say it is only about the book of Revelation, as I've heard Mormons say, because we see the same thing in Proverbs, in Isaiah, in Deuteronomy. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues which are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. Do not add, do not take away. Going back to Matthew 15, we have a situation where Jesus condemned people for teaching his precepts of God, the inventions of men. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. In us, that is in the apostles, you might learn not to exceed what is written in order that no one may become arrogant in behalf of one against another. You have a haughtiness and arrogance when people exceed what is written in Scripture. Isaiah condemns it. Quoting Isaiah, Jesus condemns it. <clears throat> the Greek Orthodox Church the Roman Catholic Church, Mormonism, Christadelphianism, the Jehovah's Witness Watchtower Society, and others, they can only exist by doing what Jesus condemned the corrupt religious establishment of his day for. Roman Catholicism couldn't exist without doing it. You will not find rosary beads or indulgences or the sale of indulgences or mass cards or any of these things in Scripture. You will not find necromancy. You will not find any other intercessor between God and man other than Jesus the righteous. You will not find hyperdulia, the veneration of Mary. You will not find any of these things. They must exceed the things that are written. They must teach as precepts of God things that are inventions of men not found in Scripture. But we've talked about this before on other recorded teachings. I'd like to look now, though, at the issue of consistency. Consistency. Look with me, please, to 1 Peter. 1 Peter. First Peter, chapter 3, quotes from Isaiah, chapter 40. And it says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures or endureth forever. Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. The grass withers, flower fades, the word of the Lord endures forever. It endures forever. And Peter quotes this. What's happening here? Now, the Holy Spirit did inspire other Hebrew prophets after Moses to write canon. The Holy Spirit, at the command of Jesus to the apostles, did inspire the apostles 
to write Tannen. But it was inspired Tannen. It came from God directly by his spirit. It was the Holy Spirit. And it was Jesus, who is God made man. Jesus never taught to take away anything. We read this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 17. Don't think I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. The word of the Lord endures forever. Fulfillment of the law, fulfillment of the Levitical sacrificial system, yes. Abolition of the law of God, no, it does not change. It is there and always will be. It just doesn't. Well, let's compare biblical Christianity and biblical Judaism to false Christianity and false Judaism and also to certain other religions. Now look, Buddhism has many forms. Theravada, Zen, Tibetan, Mahayana, and uh, these various forms of, of Buddhism, uh, Vajrayana. One is esoteric, one is philosophical, one is reincarnational, one is mystical, one is polytheistic. Many Buddhisms, there's no single religion of, of Buddhism because they're too diverse in what they worship and who they worship or if they worship at all. The Judeo-Christian faith should not be like that. But what happens when that happens? Well, let's begin with Judaism. We have something known as the Torah Be'al Peh, the oral law. It existed in the time of Jesus, and he condemned it, teaching his precepts of God, the inventions of men. But it was not written down until the time of Yehuda Hanasi in the second century in Galilee. And not all of it was written down. But then we have commentary. Commentary on the Torah and on the prophets. That the rabbis, the rabbis, proclaim to be canonical. Even going so far as to say that there were rabbinic teachings given to Moses on Mount Sinai that were not written down, and the rabbis later revealed them. Now this in itself is in direct contradiction to the Hebrew Scriptures. Look with me, please, to the book of Joshua. Joshua was told to read the Torah that God gave to and through Moses. In verse 35, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers who were living among them. Everything that God told Moses was written Joshua read it. The claim of rabbinic Judaism, that rabbinic invention, doctrines of rabbis, was actually given by God to Moses but not written down, is in direct contradiction to the Hebrew Scriptures. Talmudic Judaism contradicts biblical Judaism. It is something which is simply just not true. But it goes on and on and on and gets worse and worse. The first inspired commentary of Scripture 
was the epistle of Hebrews. That explained the Old Testament to Jewish believers in Yeshua. That explained the meaning, the typology, the symbolism of the Levitical sacrificial system. But then you have a deviant rabbinic commentary. The first was the Mishnah. Mishnah. The Mishnah was written in the third century CE or AD, if you're a Christian. The third century. Commentary on the Mishnah <laughs> and its codifications is called Gemara from the Hebrew Ligmor to finish or to close. It is the same term, basically, the same root term or short as you found, find in Gemara, as in Sodom and Gemara, the end, the finish. So Mishnah plus <coughs> Gemara equals the Talmud. This goes on and on, and they add further and further additions. In time, there are tractates. There are things like the Tosefta. There are other codifications that would come along later, such as the Shulchan Aruch by Rabbi Yosef Karo. But more and more and more commentary and commentary on commentary. Going from the third century common era until the time of Moses Maimonides, Rambam, 1170 to 1180. Rambam was an Aristotelian philosopher, much like Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas Aristotelianized Roman Catholicism with his Summa Theologia. Rambam did the same thing with his guide for the perplexed, but his ultimate commentary on the commentaries, which he called Mishnah Torah, 1170 to 1180, from the third century all the way to the 12th century. Isaiah said it will be line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. In other words, while Scripture is consistent, while the Word of God is consistent, while Torah is consistent, while the Tanakh was consistent, Rabbinic Judaism has been consistently inconsistent. It is not consistent. It evolves. So much of the rabbinic literature involves debates of rabbis putting across contrary positions in disputations with each other. And then some other rabbis coming, trying to reconcile the two the varied opinions of other rabbis or sages, and then there'd be commentary on that, and this goes on for over a thousand years. Rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism you see today, is not Mosaic or Levitical. The true heirs of Mosaic, of Levitical, of Biblical Judaism, is that Judaism fulfilled in Yeshua, the Messiah, explained in the epistle to the Hebrews? What is falsely called Judaism today is better called rabbinism. It must add to the word of God, doing what Isaiah condemned, and add additions to the additions century after century after century, and it goes well beyond that into the Hasidic movement and the capitalists. And there's no end to it. No end to it. 
False Judaism is consistently inconsistent. While the word of the Lord endures forever, while it says what it means, it means what it says. That which adds to it will always be inconsistent. We can say this about the Eastern Orthodox Church. Drawing heavily on the Church Fathers, the Patristic writers, particularly Chrysostom. But let's look at Roman Catholicism. The constitutional motto of the Roman Catholic Church is sempre agen, always the same. This is pure nonsense. What is the same about Roman Catholicism is its deep AD doctrine. The Catholic Church has two kinds of doctrines, proxima fede and deep fede. The deep fede doctrines cannot change. For instance, Although Aristotle's theory of accidents is debunked by modern science, Roman Catholicism must continue to teach it as the basis of transubstantiation because it's a deep fading doctrine, even though it is scientifically debunked. They can't change it. But they continue to change and change and change beyond that. Let's look. The origins of Roman Catholicism have roots before the time the Catholic Church began. The Roman Catholic Church institutionally, as we know it, began in 590 AD, 590 CE, during the reign of of Gregory the First, Pope Gregory the First, who the Catholics call Gregory the Great. But some of its beliefs go back well before that to the Church Fathers in the Patristic Age, particularly the post nicene Fathers, some of whom they call Doctors of the Church, and even some slightly earlier. Cyprian of Carthage, Ambrose of Milan were both major, major influences on Augustine of Hippo. Augustine of Hippo is the seminal harbinger of both Catholicism and Protestantism. He's not a church father in the East, but both Protestantism both Lutheran and Reformed Calvinism and Roman Catholicism derived strongly from Augustine. The Reformers did not go back to the New Testament. They went back largely to what Augustine said about it, even though they claim to be scriptura sola. We've explained this before on other teachings. But let's begin to look at some of these things. Cyprian of Carthage was a sacramentalist. But it wasn't until 300 AD when the sin of necromancy began, praying for the dead. You see people now kneeling down before graven images, icons, statues of dead so-called saints or, or dead saints asking the saints to be intercessors and praying to the dead or praying for the dead, some kind of posthumous salvation. That did not begin until 300 AD. Okay. Other changes begin to happen. I'll ignore the historical changes, but I will look at the theological and doctrinal changes. In 375 AD, we see the beginning of the veneration of angels 
of dead saints and the use of icons. The scripture says you shall not make a graven image of anything on heaven above or earth beneath, bow down to them and serve them. Now, this is not necessarily a prohibition against religious art, but when you begin genuflecting before statues or bowing before icons, as you have in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, believing the icons a window into the metaphysical or the Roman Catholic tradition, now we have a problem. 375 A.D., the veneration of angels and dead saints. 394 A.D., the Mass is formulated as a daily sacrificial ritual. The Mass was not there until 394 A.D., officially. 431 the veneration of Mary and the first use of the term Theotokos, Mother of God, at the Council of Ephesus. What essentially happened in the 5th century at the Council of Ephesus was that where Diana of Ephesus had been worshipped as the Queen of Heaven, they took the pagan deity, female cult deity of Diana, and ascribed her attributes to the mother of Christ, at least ostensibly. Mary became queen of heaven. 431 AD, 5th century. 500 AD, the priests began to dress in religious garb, different than the people. Neither Jesus nor the apostles, the early Christians, they didn't dress differently than everyone else. One possible reference in uh, the book, History of the Church from Christ to Constantine by Eusebius gives one possible exception. But the idea of a clergy class dressing differently than the people, that didn't happen until 500 A.D. 526 A.D. We've always had anointing the sick with oil, but now you have extreme unction. That's something very different. 551. At the Council of Chalcedon, it is declared that the Patriarch of Constantinople is the head of the church in the East, the Greek-speaking East of the Roman Empire, as the Pope was the head in Rome of the Latin-speaking West. Two papacies. The Crusades were in part fought over this. The Crusades were not just the Latin church fighting the Muslims. It was the Latin church fighting the Eastern church to try to force them back under the Pope. Some, such as the Maronites, did. You have Eastern rites of the Roman Catholic Church that allow their clergy to marry. And they have the same litur liturgy and Greek language instead of Latin of the Greek Orthodox Church, only they're under the Pope. It was all a political game. Became more and more about politics, money, and power. But well, let's understand it further. By the time you get to the 6th century, things really, really begin to gain momentum. In 590, the Roman Catholic Church as we know it institutionally begins with Gregory I. This has a kind of enormous combination of financial, political, and religious power. This was the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church institutionally, 
as we know it today. Three years later, in 593 AD, there is a formal rejection of the gospel of Jesus by the Roman Catholic Church when they invented the doctrine of purgatory proclaimed by Gregory I. The blood of Christ no longer cleanses from all sin. You must atone for your own in purgatory. As Paul writes in Galatians, anathema, if an, even an angel of God comes with another gospel, let him be accursed. 607 AD, the title Pope, Papa, is given to Boniface III by who? By the Roman Emperor Phocas. 709 AD, the pontifical religions of Rome ritually meet Roman Catholicism, and the kissing of the Pope's feet begin with Pope Constantine. In 786 AD, the worship of the cross, images, and relics. Now they will claim it's not worship. In Hebrew and Greek it is. Hishtak to bow down and serve. In Greek, prosciutto. When someone bows before an image, it is an act of worship in the original languages of Scripture. But let's continue. 850 AD, holy water, blessed by a priest, is instituted. 927 AD, the College of Cardinals is established. 995, calling themselves the princes of the church. 995 AD, canonization of dead saints, first by John the 15th. They didn't begin to canonize dead saints until 995 AD. 998 AD, mass attendance became obligatory. 1079 AD, the celibacy of the priesthood was decreed by Pope Gregory VII, something St. Paul calls a doctrine of demons forbidding marriage. God made them male and female and said it was good. You outlaw what God says is good, people will do something bad, pedophilia. You outlaw the natural, people will gravitate to the unnatural. The Roman Catholic Church admits that Peter, who they erroneously claimed to be the first pope, was married to Deborah. Yet, clerical celibacy, that was proclaimed a doctrine of the Catholic Church and remains one in the Latin Rite to this day. So it goes. 1090 AD, the rosary was invented by Peter the Hermit and later propounded even further by Dominic, the founder of the Dominicans. 1184, the Inquisition, the torture of people in the name of Jesus Christ, was instituted by the Roman Catholic Council of Verona in Italy. The Spanish Inquisitions came later, again perpetrated by the criminal antics of the Dominicans and worse, after the Reformation, by the Jesuits. But let's look. The sale of indulgences, 1190 AD. The teaching of transubstantiation in its present form, where bread and wine are transubstantiated, again, this draws from the debunked false science of Aristotle that was codified by Thomas Aquinas. This takes place in uh, 1215. 
And 1215 also, mandatory confession of sin to a priest to be forgiven. Not confessing our sin to the Lord, but to a priest. That's when they invented confession. 1439 AD, purgatory is proclaimed as dogma by the Council of Florence. They had to do that to sell indulgences in order to build the Vatican and to finance the construction of the Gothic and Baroque cathedrals of the Renaissance. 1545 AD, it was declared that tradition of the church, that is papal encyclicals, are of equal authority with scripture at the Council of Trent. 1546, the Council of Trent accepted 11 of the apocryphal books. We've mentioned that. 1854, the Immaculate Conception of Mary was proclaimed by Pope Pius IX. Not until 1854 did they say, Muri for Santissimus Deus, Mary's conceived without sin. The rapture of Mary, the assumption of Mary, 1950. Before that, in 1870, at the First Vatican Council, the doctrine of papal infallibility, that the Pope is infallible when speaking ex cathedra, he can't make a mistake. <sighs> Unbelievable. It goes on. 1965, Pope Paul VI proclaims Mary the mother of the church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church would like people to believe that its doctrines, purgatory, rosaries, mass cards, prayers to the dead, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, transubstantiation, these things were always around from the time of the apostles. They weren't. The Catholic Church did not even institutionally begin until 590. It did not even doctrinally begin to congeal until 300 AD. Notice It is not Semper Aden, always the same. It's consistently inconsistent. Once it has a de fede doctrine, it'll always be the same. That doctrine will not go away. But there are new ones and new ones and new ones. Islam claims the Koran is the third and final testament. And there's only one Quran, not from the time of Muhammad was it proclaimed this, but from the Caliph Uthman. And they claim it is Abdul Allah Madudi. Abdul Allah Madudi. That it's unchanged that it is the same thing that the angel Gabriel gave to Muhammad. In fact, we can, with manuscript fragments, document that there are at least 10 versions of the Quran. And at present, there are 26 printed versions in codexes, 10 manuscript versions, and 26 codex versions. Now, early Islam had no problem with this. Uh, there is one version of the Quran, the Masud version, that is minus or short three 
Sorash chapters. After the Quran, they had to add the Hadith. And then codifications of Islamic law, Sharia. It evolves. It's not consistent. Islam has been consistently inconsistent. Rival factions with rival arguments. You have this rival argumentation in Roman Catholicism between those Roman Catholic figures and religious orders who followed Plato, who were Platonic, and the ones who were Aristotelian. You had such schisms in Judaism, and you have such schisms in Islam, not just Sunni and Shia, but Ibrahimi, Ahmadi, Barhani. There are 150 sects of Islam, yet they like to claim it is one religion when there is no more one religion than Buddhism. The Mormons. There have been over 4,000, over 4,000 documented changes to the doctrines and covenants of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Over 4,000! Brigham Young said, black people are the descendants of fallen angels, that they're ugly, depraved, and mischievous. They can't be Mormons. And if any Mormon married one, they'd have to be killed. And he called this the doctrine of atonement. Later on, they changed it. It was a white supremacist religion. It was a religion where you had unbelievable amounts of sometimes Pollyanna, but also <laughs> multiple wives. Multiple wives. Sometimes multiple husbands. Brigham Young had at least 23, some say 28. It goes on and on and on. Four thousand changes. The Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses originally said the 144,000 in the book of Revelation will be the total number of Jehovah's Witnesses, then Armageddon will come. Once there was 144,000 in one, they had to reinvent it and say, this is the doctrine of the anointed ones. Not all Jehovah's Witnesses are anointed ones, and only the anointed ones take their communion once a year. That was not their original teaching. They said that Christ would come in 1914. That was the teaching of Charles Tazzy Russell and Judge Rutherford. When Jesus didn't show up, they changed the year to 1915, then to 1925, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, what did they do with 1914? They said, oh, that just meant Jesus turned his attention <laughs> to affairs on earth. No, your watchtower said he was coming. Consistently inconsistent. How do you explain this? Why has Roman Catholicism been consistently inconsistent? Why has Islam been consistently inconsistent? Why have the Jehovah's Witnesses been consistently inconsistent? Why have the Mormons been consistently 
inconsistent. Why? Why? Because they are false. But now we have another problem. You look at the World Lutheran Congress. They retracted the declarations of Luther himself. They no longer believe about the Roman Church, what Luther did as a former Roman Catholic clergyman. The Methodists in Britain and the United States have done the same with John Wesley. So has the Presbyterian Church. So has the Anglican Church. They no longer believe the 39 Articles. And then with the emergence of people like Andy Stanley and the emergence of people like um, the emergent church, Brian McLaren, and the emergence of people like Tony Campolo, what had once been brandished as evangelicism has become inconsistent with the traditional dogmas of what had always been understood to be the evangelical faith, the gospel-based faith of the New Testament. They may claim to be Jewish. They may claim to be Christian. They may claim to be evangelical. But once they are inconsistent, they're not biblically Christian. They're not biblically evangelical. They're not biblically Protestant. They're not biblically Catholic. You can't be Roman and Catholic. Roman is local. Catholic means universal. The universal body of Christ. They evolve. They change. The Lord, however, thou changest not. The grass may wither. The flower may fade. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Have a wonderful and blessed weekend.